And I'm Alonzo Martinez, Associate General Counsel at Highright, and this is Compliance in Focus, the first installment of our quarterly webinar series. While I'm a lawyer, today's webinar is not intended as legal or compliance advice. My intentions are to give you information that you'll take as talking points to raise with your teams and your legal counsel. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. During this webinar, please take the conversation to Twitter or X using the hashtag HireRightWebinar. In order to receive HRCI or SHRM credit, you must attend the full live session of this webinar. Credit information will be emailed a few days after the webinar. We are not providing copies of today's slides. However, we will send you an email with a link to a recording of this webinar session. If you are experiencing any audio or video issues, please refresh the browser window by clicking F5 on your keyboard and send us a message using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Doreen's producing today's webinar and will be monitoring the feed for any technical issues. After the presentation, we'd appreciate getting your feedback. Please take our brief survey and let us know if this session was helpful. My focus, as always, is to create sessions that are meaningful for you, so I welcome ideas for future topics. So again, take 60 seconds out of your day and let us know what you think. And press F5 on your keyboard to refresh this presentation anytime you experience any audio or video problems. Today, we are sharpening the details on this ever-evolving landscape of employment litigation and legislation. And in the first quarter, state legislatures across the United States are actively shaping policies to enhance employment rights, create fair opportunities for job candidates, and address emerging workforce challenges. And lawmakers have been busy working on laws that provide these broad protections for job seekers at the expense of additional compliance obligations on you as employers. In fact, we're monitoring several hundred bills that have been introduced covering criminal history reform, pay equity and transparency measures, bills that would restrict employers' use of credit history, data privacy bills, and as always, cannabis legalization. So that is exactly what we are going to cover today. You can see the rundown on the screen. I'll provide an overview of the current state of the law offer some practical guidance to comply or to prepare to comply with those laws. And as always, we have a lot of ground to cover today, so I'm going to try and keep a quick pace through these topics. So please do not consider this to be an in-depth discussion of any one topic, but it should provide you with a good foundation upon which you can explore. And I should mention that if you click on the resources icon in this webinar, you'll find links to materials that will help you on your compliance journey. Those links are a great resource for you to uh, for you to concentrate on. So again, settle in for this next uh, hour. Remember, if you have any questions during this webinar, use the Q&A icon and I'll try and cover those at the end. All right. We're gonna kick things off today, as always, with a broad discussion concerning criminal history reform. And here is a look at the clean slate laws across the United States. Clean slate laws expunge or seal certain criminal records from public access once somebody remains crime-free for a period of time. And we're seeing this trend towards adopting clean slate laws. It seems that instead of just restricting an employer's ability to ask a candidate about their criminal history, lawmakers are simply sealing or expunging criminal history so that it's, it's not available to employers. The goal of clean slate laws is to remove the stigma associated with criminal history so that individuals who have offended have an easier time of getting a job. But the impact on you as an employer is that if the record has been sealed or expunged from the court's indexes, then it can't be found. So obviously it's not gonna be reported to you on a criminal background check. As you can see on the screen, every state except for Wisconsin offers some form of post-conviction expungement or sealing of qualified criminal offenses to varying degrees, from those states in red that extend to felony and misdemeanor convictions to those in that orange terracotta color that apply to limited offenses as specified by the state. Those states that feature a star offer automatic expungement of sealing or uh, sealing of qualifying offenses well, those without a star require that an ex-offender petition the court for relief. Wisconsin offers judicial pardons, but criminal records are not sealed or expunged. And here is an update for you. Pennsylvania amended its clean slate law. Let's talk about the changes. 
First, employers are now protected from being sued if they hire somebody with an expunged record who later does something wrong if the candidate voluntarily told them about that expunged record. Before Pennsylvania's law was unclear, there was ambiguity about whether employers could face a negligent hiring lawsuit for employing somebody with an expunged record if that person later caused them harm. This revised law in Pennsylvania makes it clear that employers are immune from harm. Second, the law expands the availability of automatic expungements to pardons. The Pennsylvania board that grants pardons will now regularly advise the courts to expunge these records. Once cleared, private companies can't use this information for hiring, can't use it for housing or school applications unless federal law requires them to do so. And again, remember that these records will be removed from the court's indexes. And third, the law reduces the waiting period for automatic expungement from 10 years to seven years. Quick reminder, under existing law, Pennsylvania employers are generally required to only consider job-related misdemeanor and felony convictions when making hiring decisions. That's the update to Pennsylvania's Clean Slate Law. As I mentioned at the top of the call, we're focusing on pending legislation today. So this is the first of many maps that I've created for you. Um, it's going to show you the state of legislation that's currently under consideration with respect to clean slate laws. So you see lawmakers in Hawaii, Kansas, Oklahoma, and West Virginia, and have, West Virginia have proposed laws that would automatically expunge certain qualifying crimes. You see that in red. In Aqua, you see the states with existing clean slate laws that have proposed adding additional types of crimes that are eligible for automatic expungement. Ohio and Maine, shown in blue, are considering expanding petition-based relief. Colorado, Maryland, and Virginia, shown in that wine color, have clean slate laws with automatic relief, but are considering legislation that would allow individuals to petition for expungement for crimes that aren't eligible to be automatically expunged. So as always, I'll continue to monitor the bills in these states and we'll update you in the next quarter should any of these bills become law. As we continue with our criminal history reform discussion, let's take a look at the landscape of ban the box jurisdictions impacting private employers at the state and local levels. In all 39 of the jurisdictions on the screen, you can't ask, have you ever been convicted of a crime until later in the hiring process? In the 19 jurisdictions you see on the screen in red text, the ban the box measure applies to any form of work for monetary gain. So if you pay somebody to do a job, they're subject to that ban the box law. So this would include not only your traditional employees, but also your contractors. You know that I love to say this, not all ban the box laws are created equal. In all ban the box jurisdictions, you generally can't ask the candidate if they've ever been convicted of a crime during the initial application or request a criminal background check before a conditional offer. Those are those jurisdictions shown in the gray standard box. But some jurisdictions require special handling. On the screen, you'll see those in that aqua column that require that you identify the criminal conduct that may disqualify the candidate from hire and provide them with notice as part of the pre-adverse action process. There are those in the blue column that require that you conduct and provide an individualized assessment that relates the candidate's criminal conduct to their job as part of the pre-adverse action process. In Los Angeles and New York City, shown in that wine colored column on your screen, you must also provide additional city published notices or substantially similar forms as part of the pre-adverse action process. And then there are four jurisdictions, Louisiana, New York, Atlanta, and Gainesville, Florida, that don't specifically ban the box, but do require that you conduct an individualized assessment. As a reminder, an individualized assessment is your analysis of the candidate's criminal history and its potential relationship to the position for which they are under consideration. While you have to perform the analysis, you don't necessarily need to provide it to the candidate unless specified. I always reference the EEOC's 2012 guidance to employers concerning the use of arrest and conviction record, records as a good read that can help you understand the individualized assessment process. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, I've linked it to it in the resources section of this webinar. I always like this piece of guidance. It's really, really helpful, I think, for employers. So as you can see, you can't adopt a one-size-fits-all model for compliance. You have to modify your adjudication and pre-adverse and adverse action processes to align with a particular jurisdiction's law. So with that said, 
Just a quick reminder that you can use Higher Rights Compliance Workbench Solution to manage your Band the Box obligations. The solution is free, so let us know if you want more information when you complete the survey. And a quick plug, you can find our Band the Box white paper in the resources section of this webinar and our resources library. If you're a Higher Right client, you'll also find our sample pre-adverse and adverse action templates for your reference within Compliance Central within Screening Manager. That's where you're going to find the sample pre-adverse and adverse action uh, pamphlets. So let's move on and talk about what's going on in Philadelphia. Back in 2011, Philadelphia was one of the first cities to ban the box, effectively to say that private employers can't ask about a person's criminal record until they are offered a job. They've since amended their ordinance a couple of times in 2018 and in 2021. Basically, the city's ordinance prohibits employers from asking about a candidate's criminal record until after a conditional job offer has been extended. Also, an employer can't refuse to hire someone just because they were arrested but not convicted. If an employer does decide not to hire someone because of their criminal record, then they have to conduct an individualized assessment. They have to look at each criminal case individually to see if it's a risk for that job. The recent amendment to Philadelphia's ordinance concerns what employers can do if someone's criminal history has been exonerated. This means that they were found not guilty after initially being convicted. The revised ordinance tell us that an employer is prohibited from rejecting someone because they, ex they were exonerated, exonerated or because they were found not guilty later on. And being found not guilty later on could mean a few things like being pardoned, acquitted, or having the case dismissed by a court. The revised ordinance also changed how far back employers consider someone's criminal record. Before, the look back period was seven years. Now, employers are limited to considering seven years uh, of criminal history, but also can't consider any convictions that were later found not guilty. So I'm sorry, the look back period was 10 years. It has now been reduced to seven years of criminal history, also cannot consider any conviction that was later found not guilty. Just a reminder, Philadelphia has one of the most prolonged waiting periods between the pre-adverse and adverse action notice. You have to wait at least 10 days from when you notify the candidate that you may withdraw the conditional offer because of their criminal history to the date when you actually withdraw that offer, should you choose to do so. That's the adverse action process. So you're going to want to ensure that that 10-day waiting period is built into your processes if you hire candidates in Philadelphia. Moving on to the nation's most onerous ban the box law, and that's the recent ordinance passed that impacts employers in unincorporated areas of Los Angeles County. First, it applies to any work for pay in an unincorporated LA County. So traditional employees, contractors, gig workers, freelancers, they're all in scope of this law. Employers are prohibited from inquiring about an applicant's criminal history before extending a conditional job offer unless legally required. The ordinance has several notice requirements. For example, when an employer plans to review an applicant's criminal history as part of the conditional offer of employment, they need to list all of the essential job responsibilities in the job post. This means that each job post is probably going to be unique. The employer must identify any tasks where they think the candidate's criminal history might make it hard for them to do the job well and could cause the employer to withdraw the conditional job offer. Effectively, you're doing that individualized assessment as part of the actual job post. Once a job offer is made, employers can't inquire about an applicant's criminal record until they obtain the criminal background report. They have to share the report with the applicant before discussing any criminal history, asking for more details, or providing a questionnaire about the criminal history. So, practically speaking, this means that you can't ask an applicant to self-disclose their criminal history even after a conditional offer of employment has been extended. Okay, so what is the sequence of events when considering an applicant's criminal history? I'm gonna walk through the life cycle. So first, when considering an applicant's criminal history, employers have to conduct an initial individualized assessment to determine if the criminal history has a direct adverse bearing on the applicant's ability to perform their job duties. If an employer intends to take adverse action based on this initial assessment, they have to follow a specific process, including providing a preliminary notice of adverse action to the applicant, allowing them time to respond, 
and conducting a second individualized assessment if the applicant provides ind additional information. So I wanna break this down and talk about this modified pre-adverse action process. Once the employer finishes their first assessment and decides that they may revoke the job offer or take an adverse action, they have to give the applicant a pre-adverse action notice that serves as that initial warning. This notice must be sent both by regular mail and email if you have an email address. Again, you have to send the notice, this pre-adverse action notice, both by regular mail and email if you have an email address. The pre-adverse action notice has to include an explanation of why the offer is being withdrawn or why this adverse action is being taken because of the individual's criminal history, information about the candidate's right to reply before the decision is final, clear details about how long they have to respond, and here's, here's the kicker, that informational notice has to be shown in bold, underlined text or capital letters, so there are formatting requirements as part of the notice requirement. There has to also be an explanation that the response can include evidence challenging the accuracy of the background check or information about rehabilitation or other relevant factors. After getting the initial pre-adverse action notice, the applicant has at least five business days to reply. If they dispute the background check as being incorrect or need time to gather evidence for their defense, then they get 10 more business days to respond. So then what happens if an applicant shares evidence of rehabilitation or mitigating circumstances regarding their criminal history? They get back to you. So if the applicant gets back to you about their criminal history, provides that evidence, another individualized assessment is necessary. And what happens then if an employer decides to take a final negative action like withdrawing that conditional job offer after that second individualized assessment? After that second assessment, if the employer decides on a final adverse action, they have to inform the applicant in writing, again, by regular mail and email, if you have that email address. And the adverse action notice has to include a final decision to withdraw the conditional offer or take that adverse action, a copy of that second individualized assessment, a, an identification of the convictions that, that led to that final adverse action information on how the applicant can challenge or reconsider the decision, um, details about filing a complaint with the Los Angeles County Department of Consumer and Business Affairs, that's the DCBA, and the state's Civil Rights Department. And if the final notice is sent more than 30 days after the applicant's response to the first notice, the employer has to explain why it took so long. They have to explain the delay, citing reasons like emergencies or circumstances beyond their control. Here's a really important takeaway if you know about what's going on in California. Notably, employers can't withdraw a job offer just because of a delay in receiving a criminal report. Most of you know that criminal background checks in California can take a long time. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But if waiting would seriously disrupt the business and 10 days have passed since the criminal history request, then the employer can take action, but the employer will first need to tell the applicant in that initial notice why the delay is causing problems and follow a proper notification procedure that, that we just discussed. So you'll have to say California courts are, are delayed in returning background check results or there are matching issues. As a result, uh, we're withdrawing the offer, but you have to wait again, at least 10 business days. So that is the highly complex ban the box ordinance that will become effective this fall for employers in unincorporated areas of Los Angeles County. For what it's worth, I've written a step-by-step -step guide that breaks out the ordinance uh, in a, this Q&A format. I think that's helpful. I've linked to it in this webinar. So if you have questions about what's going on in unincorporated counties, uh, unincorporated LA County, I encourage you to check out that blog post Hi, right customers, I'm working on new sample templates. I should have that posted to Compliance Central well before the ordinance's effective date. All right, here is a look at ban the box and fair chance bills that we're monitoring. States in red are considering a ban the box law, note New York and Pennsylvania. Georgia is considering a fair chance law that doesn't ban the box, but does require an individualized assessment of a candidate's criminal history and California, New Jersey, and Vermont are considering expanding their existing ban the box laws. Stay in tuned. I will, of course, report on this should anything become law. 
There have been numerous issues impacting access to public records from cyber attacks in Kansas and Fulton, Georgia, uh, Fulton County, Georgia, to the ongoing saga in California. As of February 23rd, 2024, the Superior Court of Los Angeles County no longer uses birth month and year as search criteria for criminal records. Without birth month and year, matching records to a person becomes increasingly difficult, if not impossible. Think about common names. There are thousands of Maria Garcias in California, or people who use aliases or nicknames, for example. And because the Fair Credit Reporting Act, this is the act that regulates how you request background checks and how we fulfill those requests, places a duty of matching and accuracy on background check vendors, Without complete date of birth information, it severely limits our ability to serve you. It causes delays, reduces our ability to detect and report criminal history, and it changes your decision-making processes with respect to risk. So what can you do in response? Well, employers can conduct more thorough interviews to verify applicant information. You could explore specific life events, uh, employment history, especially gaps in employment and educational background. You can check data against other sources like educational institutions and previous employers. So use uh, additional verification methods. Um, professional references are particularly helpful. You might even consider integrating social media screening to help fill the gaps in criminal history. You can maintain detailed records of background check processes, including communications with background check vendors, as well as verification steps to help mitigate your risk. You can in particular, in, in terms of retail, um, you can strengthen controls around your inventory and financial processes to mitigate risks of theft or embezzlement. You can invest in programs addressing workplace violence, including things like active shooter procedures and conflict de-escalation training. Um, you can address behavioral red flags observed by supervisors, all processes and policies that you'll want to build into your program as a result of these reductions in criminal history screenings in California. Most importantly, you might consider reviewing your insurance policies covering crimes that are committed by employees and negligent hiring claims, especially for businesses that have a heavy presence in Los Angeles. And in severe cases, you might even consider moving background sensitive positions to locations with less exposure to court procedure risks. I've also covered this topic extensively. You're gonna find an article I wrote with more details linked in the resources section of this webinar. Unfortunately, the background check industry and employers in Los Angeles have been, they've been hit hard by the court's decision. Uh, although it may have been well-intentioned in terms of privacy, it has had lasting unintended consequences, keeping people, especially like uh, Maria Garcia or John Smith, from getting hired. So we'll have to see what the court does, if anything, with time. And while we're covering bad news, I'll mention that there are a number of bills that aim to limit access to certain types of information um, in terms of public records that are being considered across the country. The good news is that none are as restrictive as recent court level developments in California, but we'll report on them should anything happen in any of these states. So here is our recap. As always, I try and bring you some actionable guidance as we focus on compliance. Clean slate laws continue to take hold, which means that you will likely experience a reduction in the number of criminal records reported to you. Similarly, many of these clean slate and ban the box laws restrict your ability to inquire into a candidate's criminal history. So if you ask candidates to self-disclose their criminal history, you should periodically review your questions and any state or local instructions or notices that you provide your candidates to maintain compliance with clean slate or ban the box laws. Your sole responsibility as employers is to ensure that these notices and questions are compliant and relevant for your screening program. Just a general reminder to make sure that you're familiar with and you have established processes to comply with the specialized notices and assessments that are required in Band the Box jurisdictions. Remember that hiring in an unincorporated Los Angeles County will require specialized notices and an enhanced individualized assessment process. You can't use your standard pre-adverse and adverse action letters for jurisdictions that require special handling. We talked about Philadelphia and an incorporated LA County. 
you're going to also need to ensure that they're tailored specifically to these ban the box ordinances requirements. If you are a higher rate customer, you can manage these processes in compliance workbench or outside of our platform if you prefer, but you cannot take a one size fits all approach to ban the box compliance. And finally, you'll want to consider mitigating controls like personal history gap analysis, professional reference verification, social media screening to address limitations in completing criminal background checks throughout California. So as we close out this section, I want to remind you to get your questions in using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Also, check out that resources section that we've linked to in the webinar for a lot more information about everything that we've covered today. So let's shift gears and talk about pay equity measures. Remember that pay equity measures promote equal pay for equal work and often include a ban on asking a candidate about their former compensation until some later point in the hiring process. And pay transparency measures require that you share a pay range with candidates and in some cases with employees as well. And here is a map I've created that shows the jurisdictions prohibiting you from asking a job applicant or candidate about their salary history. Now, 28 cities, counties, or states have enacted salary history bans. And while you can't ask about former compensation or base future compensation on an individual's compensation history, you can always ask them about their salary or pay expectations. Asking, what do you expect to make in this role is permitted 100% of the time. And as I mentioned at the top of the call, while salary history bans were trending for a couple of years, they've largely been replaced by pay transparency laws. But we do have two new additions to our list, Columbus, Ohio, which joins Cincinnati and Toledo, also in Ohio, and prohibiting employers from asking applicants about their salary history or relying on salary history for compensation decisions. The law applies to employers with 15 or more employees in Columbus. And in Minnesota, any employer in Minnesota cannot inquire about an applicant's previous compensation or benefits, including remote positions. That said, Minnesota's law does not apply if the applicant's salary is a matter of public record or if the applicant voluntarily discloses their salary as part of a salary negotiation. And here is a map I've created to show you the jurisdictions requiring you to either post or provide a salary range for any open positions. Most pace transparency laws note that the range you publish is what you reasonably expect to pay a worker. So you'll likely need to conduct a pay analysis by role to determine the minimum and maximum ranges for these roles and share that pay range within any job posts or advertisements. And here is a table that breaks down pay transparency laws passed or becoming effective in 2024. Colorado's pay transparency law is very technical, so I'm going to cover that in the next slide. But first, let's start with Hawaii's measure, which only impacts employers with 50 or more employees and only applies to new hires. On the other hand, in Illinois, employers with 15 or more employees need to disclose the pay scale and a general description of benefits and job postings. There are also pay transparency requirements for internal positions in Illinois and employers will need to announce any promotional opportunities to current employees no later than 14 calendar days after the employer advertises the job to prospective external employees. And Washington DC's pay transparency measure requires that employers disclose not only compensation, but all monetary and non-monetary benefits to the candidate or employee. But now I want to circle back to Colorado Colorado has led the nation when it comes to pay transparency. It was the first state to enact a pay transparency law back in 2021. And in 2023, it has clarified and expanded its scope. So you'll remember that I just told you about the requirements in Illinois to notify employees about promotional opportunities. Well, Colorado expands on this concept to include notification requirements for any job opportunities, including promotional opportunities that your existing workforce might want to consider. So realistically, that's probably most of your job advertisements. You probably make those available to employees as well. And you'll see these notice requirements on the screen as part of the pre-hire process, the notification to your existing employees needs to include a wage and salary range and a general description of benefits and any other compensation. 
The notice should tell your workers when the application window for the job opportunity is expected to close. And then, as part of the post-hire process, within 30 days of selecting a candidate for a job opportunity, you're going to need to notify the colleagues of the person that you hired of that person's name, their former job title, only if they were hired from within the company. If they're external, you can omit that. Their new job title and information concerning how your employees can express interest in similar job opportunities in the future. So you want to include a statement like, visit our job board to learn more about similar job opportunities or contact HR to learn about job opportunities, something like that as part of your job postings. There is an exception for employers that are not physically located in Colorado and with fewer than 15 employees working remotely in Colorado, but all other employers must follow the pre and post hire notice requirements for all job opportunities that an internal candidate is eligible to apply for. And that is Colorado's very nuanced pay transparency law. And here are pay history bans and pay transparency bills that we're monitoring. One update, and this is an interesting one, since I created this map, Virginia's governor has vetoed a law that would have banned salary history inquiries. So you can ignore Virginia. Otherwise, we're monitoring all of this legislation and we'll of course update you should anything pass. And as we wrap our pay equity and transparency discussion, remember to assess your policies and procedures to comply with pay transparency laws and salary history bans. This means conducting a pay analysis and posting pay ranges, in many cases, both internally and externally. And if you're still asking candidates to disclose their former compensation, you may need to rethink that practice. Many employers are adopting universal practices to no longer ask applicants about their salary and are being transparent about their pay practices. And if you operate in Colorado, or if your jobs could be performed by remote workers in Colorado, it's worth taking a detailed look at their pay equity law. There is a link to a blog that I wrote that covers Colorado's law in the resources section to this webinar. And I get that it's very nuanced, so, so I highly recommend a careful look at that, at that blog article. That's our, our pay equity and transparency discussion for today. Please use the Q&A icon to submit your questions. I see a lot of you getting questions and so I really appreciate your interaction with today's webinar. So let's move on to laws restricting an employer's inquiry or consideration of a candidate's credit history. It's something that we don't talk about all that often. We haven't seen much movement in this space. The Last law passed was in Puerto Rico in 2019. As a reminder, several states have enacted laws that limited employers' ability to inquire about a job candidate's credit history. And they differ with Colorado, again, <laughs> leading the pack in its restrictiveness. Most states with credit discrimination laws simply restrict credit inquiries unless a candidate works in the financial industry or for positions with fiduciary duties, senior executive roles, roles with access to sensitive data, those kind of positions. On the other hand, Colorado not only maintains those restrictions, but it also places specific credit history assessments and adverse action processes on employers. If that sounds interesting to you and you conduct credit checks in Colorado, you might wanna check out our credit history white paper to learn more about this. It's linked in the resources section of the webinar. Again, you can't use a standard approach for Colorado. Lawmakers in a few states have introduced bills restricting consideration of a candidate's credit history. If I were a betting man, I'd put money on Massachusetts passing a credit discrimination law this year. If passed, it would be the most restrictive credit discrimination law in the United States, unseating Colorado. The law would prevent employers from asking a background check company like HireRight or a credit bureau for a report that assesses someone's credit worthiness, standing, or capacity. It also bans using such information to decide on hiring, promotions, transfers, or employee retention. It also prohibits employers from requiring individuals to discuss the details of their credit reports. Unlike credit discrimination laws in other states, which often permit credit checks for jobs involving sensitive information, the Massachusetts bill has very few exceptions. The only exceptions are for employers mandated by federal or state law to perform credit checks. For individuals that uh, will have a role meeting national security clearance, 
and for employees in financial institutions. So security clearance, financial institutions, or if required by federal or state law. Those are the only exceptions. So that means if the law is passed, most employers can no longer request credit reports of Massachusetts job candidates or employees. Again, I'm gonna keep monitoring this for you and I will write an article on it should it become law. All right, let's focus on credit restriction compliance with some actionable guidance. First, remember that you can't request credit checks for all candidates, numerous cities and states restrict credit history inquiries to specific roles or responsibilities. And you may need to conduct individualized assessments of credit history, such as in Colorado. You may also need to provide specific notices, such as in California or New York City, for example. Finally, if you operate in Massachusetts and conduct credit checks, you may need to rethink your policies and processes by January 2025 if its credit discrimination bill becomes law. Again, check out our credit check white paper, which we've linked to in this webinar. All right, my favorite part of this webinar, let's flex our mental muscles with a review of some case law. So I'm gonna walk you through a fact pattern and then ask you to decide the case. So here are the facts. I've included a little bit more detail on the screen. Uh, basically a plaintiff applied to a pre-med program at a school that required a background report from a specific consumer reporting agency. I'm calling that CRA for today's discussion. So the, pre, the, the medical school requires a background report from a specific CRA as part of its application requirements. The background report disclosed a single criminal record listed as, quote, giving false information. The report indicated that the information was obtained from an official government database, but the way the data was gathered was actually a little bit more nuanced. The giving false information charge was provided to the CRA by a data furnisher. So this is a third party that aggregates public records information. And while the giving false information charge originally appeared in a court's indexes, that was what happened when this data furnisher originally got the court record, it was later expunged. And the data furnisher that supplied the criminal record to the CRA, it didn't receive notification when the record is removed um, or when it no longer exists at an original court's jurisdiction, uh, at the, in the jurisdiction of an original court. So the report that the CRA provided to the plaintiff, it reported this criminal record and it didn't indicate that it was expunged. Additionally, the CRA did not have a policy or process to assess if court records were expunged. So after the plaintiff receives her background report, she disputes the record and provides the CRA with a copy of the expungement order. Eventually, the CRA updates the report to identify the giving false information charge. So it still reports it, but it notes that it has been expunged. The plaintiff is unhappy with the outcome and doesn't provide the school with a copy of the CRA's background report and instead requires or requests a copy of her criminal record directly from the state's repository, which indicates that she has no criminal history in that state. So what does the school do? Well, it allows her to enroll, but it tells her that she will still have to provide them with a copy of the CRA's background check. Since she doesn't want the school to know about the expunged giving false information record, she withdraws from the school and she sues the CRA. Her complaint notes that she has experienced anxiety, stress, mental anguish, anguish insomnia, embarrassment, lack of appetite, and frequent crying as a result of this um, expunged record that continues to be reported. In her lawsuit, she alleges that the CRA violated two sections of the F FCRA. One, for failing to follow reasonable procedures to assure maximum possible accuracy in the report, and two, for failing to perform a reasonable reinvestigation and correct or suppress the expunged record and maintain reasonable procedures to prevent that inaccurate information from appearing. So again, she requests her background report from a CRA as required by the med school. The CRA provides her the report. Uh, it includes this expunged record. Um, she disputes the expunged record. The CRA updates the expunged record to note that it is expunged, but continues to report it. She doesn't like that, so she sues the CRA. So it is your opportunity to be the judge. Did the CRA violate the Fair Credit Reporting Act by reporting this record? What do you think? I'm gonna give you just a few seconds to get your answers in. Did the CRA violate the FCRA? Yes or no? 
We're getting a few answers in. So there's over a thousand of you on the line, um, but we only have around 5% of you responding. So let's get a few more answers in. I'm gonna give you just a few more seconds. All right, so let's see what you think with around 35% of you responding to the question, did the CRA violate the Fair Credit Reporting Act? Yes or no, let's see, what are the poll results? The overwhelming majority of you think that the CRA did violate the FCRA. Well, here's the answer. The answer is no, there was no violation of the FCRA. Why is this? Well, lucky for us, the analysis is pretty straightforward. A consumer report requires communication of the information. In this case, the criminal record to a third party, the med school. Because the CRA provided the report only to the plaintiff, it was not a consumer report. Even though the CRA knew that the plaintiff would be submitting the report to her school, it didn't make it a consumer report because the CRA didn't actually provide it to the third party. It didn't provide it to the school. Now let's talk about the expungement issue. I have a feeling that a lot of you got hung up on the expungement issue. The court agreed that the report was inaccurate or incomplete when it excluded the expungement information. So when it just reported that giving false information charge without noting that it was expunged, that was an inaccurate report. But the magistrate judge noted that federal courts have generally held that reporting a valid conviction doesn't violate the FCRA, even if the conviction was later set aside, dismissed, or expunged. So while that original report was incomplete, once the CRA corrected the report to note the expungement, nothing more was required. Granted, I can already see you <laughs> responding to this in our, in our chat here. Granted, this would be a different matter if state law expressly prohibited reporting expunged crimes, but that was not the case in this particular jurisdiction. So if this was a California case, totally different but not in this jurisdiction. So my opinion, I think this is a pretty well-reasoned uh, decision from the court. If, if a report isn't communicated to a third party, there isn't liability under the FCRA and re reporting expunge cases is permissible under the FCRA, but again, that might differ by state law. So that's our litigation review this quarter. Thank you so much for playing. I had fun with it, I hope you did too. I'm gonna zoom through some privacy tech and employment details as we only have around 15 minutes left in today's webinar. So first, I've created this map to hopefully easily show you the current and soon to be effective data privacy laws. As a reminder, all states that have passed a comprehensive data privacy law uh, has exempted information collected and reported in compliance with the Fair, che uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act. So this means that background checks when conducted by a background check vendor or a consumer reporting agency like HireRight are excluded from the scope of these data privacy laws. And you can see the effective dates of the laws there on your screen by year. As you can see, we have, or we may have several new additions to our data privacy map as several states are considering comprehensive data privacy laws. And things move very quickly. Since I created the slide late last week, Kentucky's law has been enacted. Maryland, it, it, their bill has been sent to the governor and a final vote is expected in Nebraska this week. None of these bills impact background checks. They all have FCRA exemptions, but I will continue to of course monitor and report on this as things become law. So expect some updates in the very near future. But in the interim, I wanna remind you that while background check data is not within the scope of data privacy laws, California has included other data, such as employment-related data, into the scope of its law. And the state's regulator is aggressively enforcing the law. As a reminder, as of February, you should have posted notices telling candidates and employees how and why you collect their personal information outside of the realm of background checks. You may also need to provide or delete their data upon request. I realize that that was two sentences and an extremely brief overview of California's law, but if you want to learn more, I've linked to some great resources that the California Privacy Protection Agency has published for employers in the resources section of that of this webinar. So, so check out those resources if you are an employer in California. And there is a ton of movement in the AI space, far too much to cover here. 
I'm actually hosting a webinar concerning the use of AI and more specifically automated employment decisions in May, but I wanted to share a few updates with you. A bill in California aims to prevent employers from using automated decision tools in ways that lead to discrimination by algorithms. At the federal level, Congress is considering the, quote, No Robot Bosses Act, which requires employers to test and validate automated decision systems before deployment to notify affected individuals and provide training to users. Similar legislation to the No Robot Bosses Act uh, are being proposed in other jurisdictions, including Connecticut, Georgia, Hawaii, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Vermont, Virginia, Washington, and the District of Columbia. So again, a lot going on in the space of AI. I will cover all of this and more in next month's webinar. So, so stay tuned for more in that space. As we focus on compliance, Remember that FCRA regulated background check data is not in the scope of state data privacy laws. Still, other employment related data in California is in scope. So you're gonna to need to ensure that you have posted notices such as on your website uh, as required and have implemented processes to address data access and deletion requests. And finally, there is a race to regulate AI in the employment life cycle. Expect this to continue to make headlines over the course of the year. And if it does, I'll cover it for you in the interim, check out the resources section of this webinar to learn more. One thing I want to know, I want to mention, it's not included in today's webinar, but I actually had a question from a customer about it today. Uh, there is a new social media privacy law that was passed in New York State. I wrote about it. It's not linked to in this webinar, but if you use a web search and web search my name, Alonzo Martinez, New York, and uh, and uh, social media privacy, you'll get a, a copy of that article. Basically, um, they are prohibiting employers from requesting that an individual provide them with their social media credentials. However, an employer may continue to search for publicly available social media information. That's it in a nutshell. Again, check out my article for more information. So let's move on and quickly talk about cannabis reform. I use the terms cannabis, marijuana, THC interchangeably. They are the same thing. So please do not let that confuse you. Here is our medical cannabis map. Looking at your screen, you'll see states in red where accommodation is likely not required. States in aqua where anti-discrimination measures are in place and where reasonable accommodation and medical marijuana is necessary. States in blue where the law is silent on the issue of accommodation. And Philadelphia shown in purple or that wine color, which is banned pre-employment marijuana testing. The remaining states in gray have not passed a medical cannabis law. And when I talk about cannabis accommodation, I mean that in certain states, you cannot discriminate against an individual just because they are a lawful cannabis user. Connecticut, for example, just clarified their law via case law. Check that out. And of course, the need to accommodate not only differs by state, but also by role. For example, there are typically, but not always exceptions to accommodation for individuals in certain safety sensitive positions but there are always exceptions for those in DOT regulated positions. And here is our recreational map, which I've also revised for clarity. As you can see on the screen, 23 states and DC have legalized recreational cannabis, also known as adult use legalization. While locations in red have no impact on employers, those jurisdictions shown in aqua, blue or purple are different. Those jurisdictions shown in aqua allow for pre-employment testing for cannabis, but the statutes say that an employer cannot impact employment due to a positive test for THC. And in California and Washington, shown in blue, you are not able to conduct pre-employment tests for non-psychoactive THC metabolites. That means that you're not able to conduct pre-employment tests that uh, include things like urine or hair samples in California and Washington to test for THC. If you want to continue drug testing in those states, you'll either need to remove THC from your drug testing panels or move to oral fluid screening. Shifting gears, in New York State and Minnesota, pre-employment testing for cannabis is prohibited unless an exception applies. So again, please ensure that you've aligned your drug testing panels accordingly. This isn't something that's automatically done for you. Um, it requires your direction since some of your positions may be exempt from the prohibition on testing. Please let us know if you need help with adjusting your panels when you complete the survey at the end of today's webinar. And let's quickly look at pending legislation. 
The states in Aqua have proposed recreational or adult use measures, and lawmakers in the states with that Aqua and red stripe pattern have introduced separate medical and adult use bills. So those are two bills that increases the chances that one or the other, or maybe both bills will pass. In their current form, none of the proposed bills are overly burdensome on employers. That said, things can change. I will keep watching the legislation. Pennsylvania and New Hampshire bills have decent chances of passing, but are meeting a little bit of resistance. Um, and since I created this map, the recreational measure in Hawaii has failed. I thought it was gonna pass. It failed um, as a result of funding issues. Um, as a reminder, Hawaii already has legalized medical marijuana, but I'll keep looking at where these bills are going and of course provide you with an update should anything occur. And here is our compliance and focus summary. By way of actionable guidance, I'll lead by saying that it is impractical to maintain zero tolerance drug policies. Instead, employers should focus on cannabis use and impairment at work and ensure that policies are amended to reflect that position. It's also really important to adjust your policies and practices so that if a drug test is positive for marijuana, you understand whether the individual is a medical user or a recreational user. In some cases, you may have to accommodate the medical use of marijuana, but not the recreational use. And then there are some jurisdictions like Washington, D.C., where you have to accommodate all marijuana use, period. There are no exceptions. Finally, you have to revise. You have to remember to revise your drug testing panels too exclude marijuana were required for most jobs, such as in Minnesota. And we talked about California and Washington State. There you need to exclude testing for non-psychoactive marijuana metabolites. You can't use urine or hair. You'll need to use oral fluid if you want to continue drug testing in those states. Again, adjustments to your drug test panels are not something that your screening provider is going to do for you because they do not know if the candidate that you are considering may work in a position where marijuana testing is permitted or if impacting the employment of someone who tests positive is allowed. Again, this is your responsibility. So please let us know if you need help adjusting your drug testing panels when you complete the survey at the end of today's webinar. And to reiterate, any jurisdiction that has passed a law legalizing marijuana for medical or recreational use always exempts DOT regulated positions, positions serving a federal contract or subject to federal funding. And in many cases, but not always, safety sensitive positions as defined by that jurisdiction statute. That is everything I have on marijuana legalization. If you are still confused about what is or is not allowed, get your questions in using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen and check out the resources section of this webinar for a lot more information. And now we have just a little bit of time for one update concerning I-9 and E-Verify. And that is a joint fact sheet published by the Department of Justice and USCIS. The fact sheet reminds employers that they are responsible for ensuring that software products aren't discriminatory and comply with Form I-9 and E-Verify requirements. The guidance or fact sheet covers several do's and don'ts. I've summarized those, summarized those on the screen for you. Essentially, the guidance reminds employers to use the current form of uh, current version of Form I-9 to comply with the electronic signatures and document storage requirements. Specific software capabilities include allowing employees to leave non-required form fields blank, uniquely identifying users ac accessing the form and, ret and retaining employee information and documents. Employers using software interfaces for E-Verify case completion must comply with E-Verify program requirements, including specific software capabilities as described in the fact sheet. I've linked to that fact sheet in the resources section of this webinar. Check that out if you are interested in it. It's very straightforward and in all fairness, it basically captures things that all I-9 and E-Verify software solution providers are generally providing to you now, but worth looking at. So I'm gonna wrap up with a quick reminder that you should have transitioned to new form I-9 by November 1st, 2023. Employers are responsible for ensuring that their software solutions comply with these requirements. And I didn't cover this, but just as a reminder, there is now a virtual remote verification process available to you as a result of new Form I-9. Again, we've written about this extensively, so check that out. And um, finally, uh, there's a bit of news that I'm, I'm tracking. I'm sure some of you have heard about this, but there is a new E-Verify Plus solution that USCIS, USCIS is, is uh, 
touting. We don't know a lot about it, um, but we're monitoring it. We're hopeful that it'll be available for third-party agencies like HireRight. We're not certain at this point, but we'll continue to monitor it and we'll let you know should any developments happen along those lines. So here is a quick plug as you continue to get your questions in. Uh, we have several outlets of information for you to consume. So if something piqued your interest today, check out our resources library, blog, or Forbes articles to learn more. And thank you so much for the interaction today. I apologize for the late start, a few technical difficulties, but we do have time for just a question or two now. Uh, if we don't get to your question today, know that there will be a blog posted in a few weeks that will capture all of your all of the themes from your questions. If it is a pressing issue, let me know when you complete the survey and I'll get back to you more quickly. So let's talk about Let's talk about what's going on in unincorporated LA County. Yeah, um, a lot of questions regarding that. And in particular, questions about the ability to ask a candidate about their criminal history. So the restriction on criminal history inquiries, um, it, it, it works twofold. First, the ordinance intends to offer criminal ex-offenders a fair chance at employment. So. So first, it prohibits inquiries into criminal history before a conditional offer of employment, but it, it also requires that a criminal background check be conducted and provided to the applicant before discussing their criminal history with them. So what does that really mean? Well, the net result is an outright ban on criminal history discussions unless an applicant knows what the employer knows about their criminal history. Again, check out that article I wrote. It gives you a really, uh, it gives you a lot of really good detail about what's going on in the unincorporated LA County. Um, we're continuing to get a ton of questions in, so thank you again for the engagement. But I do want to be mindful for time. So uh, again, let me know if you have a pressing question when you complete the survey. Um, but we're gonna, we're basically about out of time. So you can expect this webinar to be posted to the Higher Right Resource Library shortly. There are also questions about SHRM and HRCI credit. You'll get an email with your SHRM and HRCI credit in just a few days. I'd like to thank you all for your time today. Please take 60 seconds to complete the webinar survey. I take your feedback seriously. It is my report card, so please let me know how I'm doing. And with that, we'll chat again in July where we'll talk about all the new legislation that's been passed in our mid-year update. Until then, thanks again for spending a portion of your day with me today. Look for updates on Forbes and the Higher Right blog, and we'll meet again in the summer. Thanks, everyone.